Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember it so you don't have to. And welcome to another installment of What You Never Knew. This is where we look back at movies you've seen a million times but still manage to miss one or two little details. With that said, let's take a look at one of my favorite comedies ever, Hot Fuzz! This is arguably the world's greatest satire of American action movies. It's fast, it's clever, every bit of dialogue comes back into play one way or another. It's one of the most ingenious comedies of all time. So ingenious that chances are you've missed one or two subtle touches that worked its way right past you. And we're here to look at them today. Now it goes without saying you have to have seen the movie to get all these, so a lot of plot details are going to be revealed. Or, to put it another way, SPOILERS! They're not behind the scenes facts or nitpicking plot holes, they're just the kick-ass little moments you never realized were making the movie more kick-ass. So let's not waste any time, let's take a look at Hot Fuzz! Cameo time! Hello Stephen Coogan, hello Kate Blanchett, hello Peter Jackson, hello Davy Jones, hello... Nicholas Angel? Yep, Nicholas Angel, the main character, is actually named after the music supervisor of Shaun of the Dead, The World's End, and of course, Hot Fuzz. I guess he must have been a really nice guy. The fact is, you've been making us all look bad. I'm sorry, sir? While Sergeant Angel gets attention for Operation Crackdown, he's also gotten awards for two other operations. And yes, if you read them in order, they are Operations Crackdown, Shakedown, and Takedown. Speaking of which, all the people who will eventually end up as villains in this movie also have very cryptic last names, including Hatcher, Skinner, Reaper, and Shooter. While we're on the subject of names, Norris Tree, where a lot of the action takes place, is also named after cheese star Chuck Norris, who's even referenced in the movie. And did you ever notice this joke? She wants to go through the whole phone book. Yeah, we'll put a call into Aaron A. Aronson, shall we? What's your name? Aaron A. Aronson. Sorry? A lot of people missed that the first time. This arcade game appears in every single film in the Cornetto trilogy. That being Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and World's End. As well as this fence joke. You're probably wondering, why is it called the Cornetto Trilogy? That's because every film has a Cornetto ice cream dish in it. And in a bizarre inspiration from Krzysztof Kolowski's Three Color Film Trilogy, yes, they actually do kind of make a reference to that, their colors symbolize an element of the film. In Shaun of the Dead, it's red for zombies. In Hot Fuzz, it's blue for police. And in World's End, it's green for aliens. Yeah, okay, not the deepest symbolism, but it's still there. You're saying this wasn't an accident. Hot Fuzz is actually praised by police for one realistic portrayal of crime work. Can you guess what it is? No. No. Definitely not. It's actually the paperwork. Most officers point out that the paperwork is never addressed in cop films, yet this one shows it being done after every single event. Many were happy that arguably the most annoying and tedious part of the job was finally getting some recognition. Good catch. There's no way you could perpetrate that amount of carnage and mayhem and not incur a considerable amount of paperwork. While we're on the subject, three-fourths of the film is pointing out why a lot of the actions in, well, action movies couldn't happen in real life. Because of this, the film tries to account for the lack of action by making mundane things look like intense, action-packed moments. Even though little is going on. Additionally, when the film's climax does decide to indulge in every action film cliché known to man, a lot of the mundane lines said before suddenly come back as classic badass one-liners. Fascist. Seven across. Hag. It's twelve down. Fascist! Hag. Did you ever notice that when Timothy Dalton drives by a murder scene, there's always a fitting song playing? For example, when he drives by the dead actors from Romeo and Juliet, the song Romeo and Juliet is playing. Sing streets of very me. Or when he drives by the flaming corpse of another victim, a song emphasizing fire is playing. Fire! To destroy all you This isn't surprising seeing how the sound design team often reinforces and foreshadows what's going to happen in the film. 
Like cutting the hedge clippers foreshadows this woman's death. I was just about to pop off, actually. Or indicating a staff stupidity with a wrong answer buzzer. My work for Listen closely and you'll hear them all throughout the film. Oh no! I'm the chief inspector. Innuendos foreshadowing the characters' deaths are also all over the place. Some obvious? Hopefully that's the last we'll see of him. Tim! I'll make sure everyone gets their just desserts. But others, kinda so. Well, I said, kinda. Pack it in, Frank, you silly bastard! While there certainly is a mystery trying to be solved, most people miss there actually are two being set up. The quote-unquote real one centers around the tackiness and non-rustic nature of people who need to be axed off for the neighborhood's peaceful appearance. But there is another totally plausible murder plot about a bypass, land ownership, expanding corporations. You see, the land merchant was buying had little value in of itself. It will be a prime location for, say, a retail park. It all falls ingeniously into place except for the fact that it just wasn't the motive. In reality, the motives were much more childish and juvenile making the joke all the more hilarious. Blower's fate was simply the result of his being an appalling actor. You murdered him for that? Well, he murdered Bill Shakespeare. What? This film is like the psycho or vertigo of comedies, writing such a complicated and clever setup only to have it lead to something completely different. Pretty damn clever. It's all about the greater good. The greater good. The swear jar has all the words you can't say blocked out, except for arguably the most offensive word in the English language. That one is shown in its entirety. Priorities, I guess. What a cunt. On a sentimental note, we see Danny and his father at the carnival get dressed up in the exact same cowboy outfits they wore when Danny's mother was still alive, showing he still has that quite sensitive side to him. Though not sensitive enough not to pull out a club on a swan. I love that. An interesting notion, Sanford has a city model where part of the climax takes place. It's possible that one of the ways Sanford wants to be a model city is to literally have a model city. Even the sign sort of reinforces that it wants you to associate that term with the town. Also interesting to note that while Dalton attacks the journalist with a steeple, it's fitting revenge that a steeple is what ends up attacking him. And of course, just as gruesomely. You might have noticed very quickly that Fisher is not the best officer. What do we reckon? Angel. Huh? Help me. If he didn't get it before, perhaps this subtle image might help. And the number one thing you never knew about Hot Fuzz is... Nobody dies in the climax. Yeah, think about it. It's violent, it's gory, it has all the action cliches expected out of such a scene, but bizarrely enough, every single person lives and goes to jail. My thought is that maybe Angel is so die-hard on being a good police officer and going by the book that he never officially kills anyone. That is what a cop is supposed to do, right? Get him out of a situation as peaceful as possible? And while Danny always talks about those great action scenes where they blow up a whole bunch of guys, in this one, not one ever gets killed off. So they end up playing it both their ways. The only one who I assume doesn't get out alive is the guy who knocks into the bomb at the end. But even then, so many people unrealistically make it out that it's strangely possible he might have too. I don't know, if someone can survive this, why couldn't someone survive this? Well, even if he does get axed off, it still wasn't Angel who killed him. He just knocked him on his feet, leaving him totally murderless and still the best cop that Sanford's ever had which ties in all the more to the consistency and kick-ass nature this awesome comedy has to offer. Are there any more that we missed? Are there any little details we're talking about? Well, leave them in the comments section below and keep talking about a movie that's definitely worth talking about. I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy, remember it so you don't have to.